Hey guys, wanted to come on and share with you some nuggets that I've been gaining from Isaiah chapter 53. I know it's been a while since I've been on, especially the thing that I mentioned last time with the 144,000 and being taken off for a time. And there may have been some other things involved in that. But I wanted to come on and share with you guys just some nuggets that I've been getting from Scripture. And I pray that it will make sense to each and every one of you. But before we go in, let's just have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, illuminate our minds, draw us ever closer to your heart. This is what we pray and we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles on you, I invite you to go to Isaiah chapter 53. This is what I've been looking at in my devotional studies recently. And the nuggets that I've been getting from that chapter, friends, is so powerful. We are actually told that we should try to memorize this chapter. All of the scripture we should memorize. But this chapter, revealing to us the things concerning our Savior, is, I would say, imperative that we memorize. And so we're going to Isaiah chapter 53. But before we get into Isaiah 53, let's start off with Isaiah 53, 52. Isaiah 53 and verse 1 tells us, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, when I read that, I was thinking, wow, what is the arm of the Lord and how is it connected to a report that's given? And what I came to realize is that in chapter 52, it tells us contextually what the arm of God is. In Isaiah chapter 52 and starting with verse 10, Isaiah 52 and verse 10, it says, The Lord had made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And then it continues by saying, And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So what is it telling us here? It's telling us the arm that the Lord has made bare is actually the arm of his salvation. His method of stretching out himself to save men and women. And so as you read the verse again, you will see that it will make sense. It says here again, the Lord had made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see that arm that he's made bare, meaning the arm of his salvation. And so the arm of his salvation, how does that salvation look? The Bible tells us in the New Testament concerning Jesus's name, it says his name shall be called Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Amen. I see a heart coming up already. You guys are going with me, right? So, in other words, the salvation, which is the arm of the Lord that he has made bare for all the nations to see, is his Son. The Son of God is the arm of God. It is his arm that is stretched out to save humanity. To save those who will receive him coming to this world, living for men in this world to save them, and ultimately dying for humanity. And so we've established now that according to Isaiah 53 and verse 1, the arm of the Lord that has been made bare to the nations is the work of salvation that he is doing through his son Jesus. And so especially when Jesus came to this world, the Bible tells us, it says, for he, Jesus, this is Isaiah 53 and verse 2 now, for he, Jesus, shall grow up before him, that is God, as a tender plant. In other words, this thing is not strong. In and of itself, it is not strong. Jesus grows up before God as a tender plant and as a root. Check this out, friends. Not out of ground that is nourished. Not out of ground that has water in it that has moisture to strengthen the plant. But friends, as a root out of dry ground, Jesus grows up. And it's interesting because that is the situation in which Jesus grew up. Christ came to a people that were spiritually malnourished. Christ came to a nation and came to a world that was dry. And the, the dryness that it's referring to, friends, that was happening within the very Jewish nation that Christ came to reform that they might reach the world, that dryness is in reference to the legalistic nature of the Jewish nation by the time Jesus came. They were dry 
in their spirituality, dry in the dryness of legalism. Friends, you know it's interesting because you could see that even in the experience of many Christians today. A legalistic view of salvation. And so what God is revealing here is that he sent Jesus into a place that is spiritually destitute of power. But even in that place, despite its spiritual destitution and legalism, Christ still grew. Christ still grew. Friends, the first point I want to bring out to us here is this. Our spiritual prosperity, meaning our spiritual growth, is not dependent on our circumstances. Our spiritual growth is not dependent on our environment. Our spiritual growth is dependent on who we are connected with. If we are connected with God, then it matters not what is around us. Spiritually, we can still grow. And Christ is the very example of this point. And friends, I'm speaking here about spiritual growth. As it concerns spiritual growth, God says, if you are connected to me, and that's what was happening with Jesus, because Jesus was ever connected with his father, his surroundings did not stifle his spiritual growth. And so it can be with you and I. God says, if we come to him, the circumstances surrounding us will not shape us. We will shape our circumstances because we are connected to one who is above every circumstance who is above every obstacle that we may be facing in life. God wants us to know that as long as He is in our corner, spiritually, we can grow. Spiritually, we can rise. Men may seek to hold us down. As the Bible tells us in the book of Romans 1, men may seek to suppress the truth of the living God. But God is faithful to the soul that seeks Him. And He will make sure that regardless of what is surrounding that saint, that saint will grow in him. Even with all the legalism in the world surrounding him, that saint will still grow. Friends, my call to us today is to be connected with God. Spend time with God in His Word, that you might have a connection with Him that will result in your spiritual growth. That despite the spiritual destitution that surrounds you, that spiritual destitution doesn't have to be in you. You can still grow if you are connected to Jesus. And so as we continue now, look at what it says concerning Jesus' ministry. His ministry was so simple, so filled with compassion and love. Contrary to the legalistic lifestyle of, of hatred in the lives of the Jewish leaders, that look at what it said. It says here, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. What is this in reference to? It's not necessarily in reference to Jesus' physical appearance, but instead it is in reference to the nature of his ministry. You see, the ministry of Christ was so opposite to what the Jewish nation had seen. It was so opposite to what the Jewish leaders were portraying before the people that to the people it didn't seem like it was of any value. This is intense. Because they looked at it, it was such a humble ministry. that The Bible says here in verse 2, He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, his ministry, <laughs> to the eyes of the leaders back then, steeped in legalism, it had no attraction to them. This is why when Jesus Christ was taken to Pilate, he wasn't taken by some atheist. He was taken by his own people. Why? The leadership of his own people took him to Pilate. Why? Because they saw no beauty in his ministry. His ministry actually was so beautiful that to them it was hateful because it drew men away from them. The ministry of Christ was so attractive to the multitudes that to the leadership over the multitudes, because they saw they were losing power and influence, 
to this ministry that Jesus was doing, they hated it to the point that they killed the Son of God. Friends, this is what this text means. Now continuing, this is what it says. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He is despised or was despised and rejected, and we esteemed him not. Now what is that ref referring to? When it says here, he was rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I was looking up what this word actually meant. These words actually meant in the original Hebrew language in which they were written. You know, this is amazing because we looked at him and we saw him as a man of sorrows. We saw him as though he were acquainted with grief. And it says here, we did not esteem him. In other words, his ministry didn't mean anything to those who were looking at it. This is why finally at the end, when he was crucified, through the influence of the priests and the scribes and Pharisees, the people followed those scribes and Pharisees in actually calling out for his crucifixion. They were so easily persuaded because his ministry was so different from their understanding of what the messianic ministry would be like. They thought he would come overthrow the Romans, and when he didn't do this, they hated it, friends. And so, under the influence of the leaders, they called for Jesus' crucifixion. But I was thinking, what do these two words, sorrow and grief, mean? So I went back to the Hebrew, I looked it up. And this is what I ended up finding out, friends. Let's continue reading. I'll bring it out as we continue reading. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Crazy stuff. We looked at him and we thought that he was the problem, not realizing that it was our mess that he was bearing. Our grief and our sorrows is what the Son of Man was bearing. And we thought he was cursed of God, not realizing that he was bearing our curse. You see, it is as a result of sin, friends, and the pain, the grief, and the sorrow that it brings, that Christ said, either I leave them to perish, or I come down into this world to save them. But in order to save men and women and children, I must bear what they have brought upon themselves. What a Savior we serve. Christ came into the world to bear the mess and along with that mess, the grief and sorrow that comes along with it, to become acquainted with it, that we might be saved. That is serious, tremendous, stupendous love. Christ came to our world to bear our mess and the sorrow and the grief that comes with it. Now, what does that word mean? What, are, what do those two words mean, sorrow and grief? Friends, the word there, grief, check this out. It actually means anxiety. You see, in a world where we face anxiety today, in a world where many are facing mental health issues, in a world where anxiety is rising and rising, in a COVID situation where people in their mental understanding, they're losing hold of themselves. Friends, Christ came to bear our anxiety. But it goes on. The word there, sorrow, actually means this. This is crazy. The word sorrow there actually means, get this, mental anguish. Do you know what mental anguish becomes when it is prolonged? Mental anguish when prolonged in the human mind becomes depression. Friends, Christ bore not only your anxieties, but your depression that comes along with those anxieties. Christ bore them both. This is actually brought out powerfully in the book, Desire of Ages. When you get time, you should check this out. As it concerns his situation in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that until the angel came and strengthened him, Christ, not until that angel came and strengthened him, friends, does inspiration tell us that the depression was taken from Jesus? You can go back there and read it. 
The very chapter called Gethsemane tells us this, that Christ was bearing the depression of humanity, not because of anything that he did wrong, but friends, because he was bearing our sins and the sins of the world accumulating upon him all the way up to Calvary when he finally bore all of the sins of mankind, both past, present, and future. The omnipresent act of the cross of Christ bearing the past, the present, and future sins of mankind. Friends, all of that weight upon him, friends, is what crushed his life out. This is why he began to sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. He was bearing our depression. And not until the angel came was it removed. The agony was still there, but now he can bear it. Now I wonder why. What was it that caused him to bear that agony for us? This is what it actually tells us. I'm going to read a statement here from a powerful book. I, I implore you guys to read this book when you get time or to get a hold of it. The name of the book is called Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. And this statement I'm about to read to you is found on page 601. This is what it states. What sustained the Son of God during his life of toil and sacrifice? He saw the results of the travail of his soul and was satisfied. Looking into eternity, this is what caused him to go through what he went through for us, friends. Looking into eternity, he beheld the happiness of those who through his humiliation had received pardon and everlasting life. He heard the ransomed one singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Friends, this is what caused Jesus to bear our sins. And along with our sins, our mental anguish, prolonged which is depression, and also our anxieties. What caused him to bear all of this? Seeing you singing throughout eternal ages. Friends, this is why we cannot miss heaven. We must be willing to give up everything that we might gain the kingdom. Why? Because we have a Savior who came and went through all of this that we might gain the kingdom. Christ went through all of this because he looked forward into the future, gaining a glimpse into eternity. He saw you and I singing before the throne of grace, saved eternally from sin, death, Satan, and self. <sighs> Friends, we cannot miss it. The sacrifice was too great. Heaven is cheap enough. Heaven is cheap enough. Continuing with our last two verses, it states here, For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. With every blow that was dealt to the Lamb of God, it brought healing. It brought restoration for us to the image of God from which we had fallen. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And while we were turned, the Bible tells us, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, while we were not even cognizant, of the fact that Jesus was paying our penalty, dying our debt, bearing our depression and our anxieties, friends, while we were not even aware of it, Christ said, I'll still do it for them. While they don't even care right now, when they see it, my goodness, I know it, will awaken repentance in their hearts. Hence, the Bible tells us it is the goodness of God that leads men and women to repentance. Friends, this is what I want you to keep upon your minds today. That Jesus bore your agony. He bore the anxieties that you are now facing. He bore the depression that you now face. And friends, I want to tell you, this is what I want to say to you. This doesn't mean <laughs> I'm not saying that, hey, because Jesus bore your depression or your anxiety, you don't get professional help if you need it. Please get that professional help. But along with that professional help, may your minds, along with this, ever be cognizant of the reality that you have a Savior that is acquainted with your 
anxiety, with your mental anguish, with the hardships that you now face, you have a savior that has gone through it before you and gone through, get this, even worse than we could ever experience. Take heart, pilgrim. Cheer up. Take heart in the Savior who gave his life for you, that you and I might have eternity, might have eternity to spend with him. With that, let's have a word of prayer as we close. Father in heaven, I pray that this made sense, Lord, that we were able to see Jesus, the salvation of God made bare, the salvation of God exposed to humanity, that that salvation, that arm stretched out to save us, is none other than Jesus. I pray that you will help us to ever look upon him who gave his life for us, who came down into our experience, that he might save us from sin. Give us power, Lord, to face the lives that we go through every day. May we not give up, but press on because you pressed on for us. Help us and strengthen us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining, friends. Thank you for tuning in. And I see many of you tapping the like, tapping the heart. And praise the Lord for that. That lets me know that you guys are resonating with me with this text. And so praise God, blessings to you, and continue to press forward in faith. I just wanted to leave this short thought of hope with you today, that you might continue pressing on, that you might have hope to press on, knowing that Jesus is coming. One day, not just to save us from sin's penalty and power, but to save us one day from sin's presence. Hang on, friends. Keep pressing. Bye-bye for now.